coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. Featuring special guest, Nashville studio legend, Eddie Bayers. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, everyone? Rich Redman here. Welcome to the Rich Redman Show. So excited coming to you live from Crash Studio in beautiful Music City, USA, Nashville, Tennessee. Of course, I'm joined by my partner in crime, Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. Thank you. And so excited to have this guest, my good friend, Eddie Bears. Eddie Bears. How are you, my friend? Good Great. to have you, brother. Good, good to see yeah. you. Good, good to good see to you. Here. It's a real thrill to have you at my place here because if people don't know our history, I moved to Nashville in March of 1997 and you were so instrumental in helping me get started. You were so kind to me, so you were so encouraging. You were what they would call nowadays, these crazy kids, a mentor. Oh. Yeah, and so I sent you my my cassette demo, Rich Redman, drums and percussion, in uh, early 1997, and you were like, yeah, kid, you sound great, get to Nashville, and then before I knew it, you were throwing me showcases and little road gigs, and, and then same with Lonnie Wilson, our friend Lonnie Wilson That's got me right. connected with some cool stuff, and yeah. even you even wrote me a letter recommendation, like, uh, Rich is a great human being and sounds really great. If you need any references, please call me. Eddie Bears Jr. <laughs> there you go. You know, so um, so just all these years later, nearly 24 years later, it's awesome to have you. 24. I 24 know. years. I think oh. you were my age. I'm in my late 40s. I think you were my age when I moved to town 24 years ago. I think you were. So, I think I was. So with your history, let me ask you something. Yeah. And somebody, you got to get hit, hit up all the time from people coming into town. Yeah. You really wanted to help Rich out, yeah, for some reason. Why was that? You know, you can. You, it's almost like an innate, mm -hmm. uh, intuitive situation where when somebody contacts you, and of course, then you get uh, a reference of their playing and their ability. Mm -hmm. That's where you can pretty well tell with somebody's talent, and you know that this is worth, you know, supporting. Right, I can get behind this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. I mean, yeah. you 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 started. The, it was like the big bang. It was like it was a it was a slow go for me in the early days. Jim was surprised to hear on our last podcast. I said, you know, I had trouble getting connected. I mean, getting really connected into it. It took me three years to get that Pam Tillis job, right? But in yeah. the beginning, I was like waiting tables and substitute teaching and parking cars yeah. and doing data entry and teaching drum lessons and playing down a lower Broadway and doing free yeah. show, doing anything I could. So, you know, three years, what is that? It's about a thousand days mm -hmm. before I got that job with Pam and someone was setting up my drums and they gave me a bottle of water. Here you go, Mr. Redman. Yeah. You know, and then after the show, someone tore down my drums. So cool. What's that? I know, I know. But um, to catch up everyone who might not be familiar, I don't know, are they sleeping under a rock that they're not familiar <laughs> with? Mr. Eddie Bears, one of the most recorded drummers in history. You've played on over 300 gold and platinum records, mm -hmm. 14 times Academy of Country Music Drummer of the Year, three-time Nashville Drummer, Nashville Music Awards Drummer of the Year, and countless times you won Country Drummer of the Year in Modern Drummer Magazine. Yeah. So in back in my, you know, I've read every issue of Modern Drummer Magazine. Yeah. For folks that aren't drummers out there, this is the most widely read drum publication in the world. And I remember seeing you, Lonnie, Jerry Croon, Tommy Wells, Owen Hale, and Milton Sledge on the cover yeah. of the magazine at the Opry. And it was so inspirational. So that's why I said, oh, I've got to reach out to these guys and see if they'll give me any nuggets of wisdom, any advice, and you took it one step further and you got me some jobs around yeah. town, you know, wow. mm. which was really, <laughs> which was great. Now, how many years have you been in Nashville? I came in uh, Christmas of 73. Wow. But I was, of course, a keyboard player. Were you? Yeah. You know. Yeah, tell us about that. You're from Maryland, right? Right. And, and you were playing, you're a classically trained piano yes, player. Yes. So, Interesting. And, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and through that, of course, as the process goes, you know, and you're in that mode, uh, 
and to make it really quick is that you know your travels playing in bands which i did and i wound up with a band in new jersey uh and we called ourselves the original cast and while we're playing around in jersey there was a, a band that was one of the top 40 bands discovered by nancy wilson in las vegas called the checkmates ltd and they were pretty well known you know um but they came in where we were and at that time i was sliding off the drums too you know like what when our drummer would go out and i'd play so he could do whatever he did and then i'd get back on the b3 they said that's exactly what we're looking for for the checkmates so me uh three of us out of that band left and went with the checkmates and moved to las vegas and became their backup bands because they did the same thing. You know, when their drummer, Sweet Louie, would go out, I'd get on, and when Sonny Charles got off the organ, then I'd get on. So as that went on and on, Joe Romano, who was the trumpet player, was also uh, a great orchestrator uh, and musical director, and he moved to Oakland, California, and he called me when all this was starting to disperse and said, you know, you really always wanted to finish your college you know, I said, well, I just want music, musically. And so I followed through. I moved in with him in Oakland, and I went to Laney College, you know, basically just double A, you know. And, but through that process, I've got more into that network, just the same thing as I always advise, like I do with you. So networking around Oakland, I got into a guy named Tom Fogarty, who was John Fogarty's brother. Right. Who had a little uh, group that when everybody was off tour – they would play around, you know, like Keystone Corner and then go over to San Francisco and play. And so I became their keyboard player. I was the piano and Merle Saunders, who was a great B3 player. Right? Jerry Garcia played guitar. Hmm. Uh, Tom played, uh, you know, the acoustic and, and, and guitars. So through that, then obviously it became more mainstream, mm -hmm. you know, uh, of knowing that music. So after about three years there, I heard from some people in Nashville who said, we're, uh, you need to come here, you know? So I did. And when I came, so as a keyboard player, I said, well, I got to sustain. So I heard about auditions down at Printer's Alley. So I went down. There was like three other piano players in front of me. And I'm waiting for them to do their thing. And then I got up and I played. After I played, this big burly guy came over. He said, you're my guy. Hmm. It was a quartet, you know, and he said, you're my guy. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm working at an Alba fabrication plant right now. Here in Nashville? Yeah. Day job. Yeah, a job. A day job. <laughs> a job and see yeah. something. Yeah, making album covers. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, at least you're in the industry. That's yeah, cool. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 music, in a sense. But anyway, I gave him, I told him my name. He said, I'm Larry London. Wow. I, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. Until, of course, as we friended and friended and I worked with him, I mean, we were really close. He was your mentor. Oh, my God. He was so, – when you use mentor. And I told him, I said, I would really like to professionally get into this, you know. He goes, I've got a little pad up in between shows. Because we were like the quartet in between main uh, artists that would come into printers. And so we go up and he would show me a few things. And then after a while, when it got a little more complex, I said, you know, Larry, I just want to beat him. You mm -hmm. know, I said, I, I've been in an interpretive mode all my life. Right. You know, so I can read and I can do all that, but I just want to feel and play. Yeah. So after about a year and a half there, there was a top 40 group downtown that was the most popular one in a club. So I auditioned for them and I got that. So I spent probably maybe a little more than five years there, but then wanted to pursue the studio yeah. scene. And I was going around and I was hearing about studios and going in and checking out. And then I heard about one that was just opening and it was called Audio Media. Mm -hmm. And it was over off Division. And I walked in and I said, man, I, I would really love to get inside here and know. They said, well, we, we can't afford to pay anybody. I said, it doesn't matter. Uh, I just want to learn and be inside and I'll play. Yeah. Well, simultaneously, somebody who became my partner for 30 years, Paul Worley, who's a mm -hmm. 
known producer. You guys owned the Money Pit, right? Was that yes. Well, we well that was subsequent because this studio we were in was a production studio, so we never did mainstream. We were doing National Geographic albums, tributing somebody. Like we would do an album that uh, of John Philip Salsa. Uh, yeah. Salsa. Susa marches. Mm-hmm. John, John Philip Salsa. That sounds amazing. <laughs> well, you know, no, 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 no. Let me tell you why I say that. Yeah. Because that's like a parody. Oh, like <laughs> so, yeah. When I would say you want to hear John Philip Salsa, da 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 called you yeah. stop by the studio said this is what i do this is what i'd like to do can you use me yeah it's like the phil ramon story of he started sweeping the studio floor and cleaning the bathroom yeah and you work your way up do you this how i got on the radio how do you uh do you see that happening with today's youth or no <laughs> no i don't and i'll tell you why it's because <clears throat> let's face it right in your room here we could cut a full-blown album you know? know yeah so that pretty much is the way of the world most of the facilities, as we know, you know, we knew Sound Shop went away. We knew that. The condos now. Yeah. The just condos. So, yeah. But, you know, I, the only thing that I say, I mean, I know I see all the squawk and everything. What a shame. Historic, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, Ray Stevens, uh, you know, 17 grand gone. They leveled uh, it. I saw it. I, wow. Well, yeah, but you know what, as a businessman, because the one thing I know, even though we're doing what we do, mm-hmm. you've learned this is business music. Yes. Yeah. It's not music business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, as you have your places and your properties and stuff you get in, let's just hypothetically say somebody came up to you and you had a iconic studio that depended off the phone to ring. Mm-hmm. So you knew what the way of the world was at that point of how many times are you frequented to be doing sessions, you know, yeah, and making your uh, nut and knowing what it would take as somebody comes in and says, I'll give you $3 million. And, Cash in. I'll and, take it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, mm-hmm. you're going, wait a minute, I can secure me, my kids, my family. I, I, think, yeah. I think Ray sold that for $20 million. I, I mean, because it's a prime spot right there on the corner. Yeah. I mean, wow. It's it's just the the way, I mean, it's happening with all the creative arts these days, that that uh, the barrier to entry is getting lower. Mm-hmm. You know, like you were talking about, you can do it right here in yeah. a studio in a house, make a great sounding album. The only thing you miss out on is, is there a difference in how these albums are sounding now? Oh, God. now that everybody's not in the same room. I'll tell you what, I was feeding just, off of each I other. was just talking about that last night again, you know. And we were reflecting on the records today. Yeah. So we know that the little wizards that are coming out, the Pro Tools uh, wizards at, yeah, at 18. Not demeaning them, yeah. but when they get in and they do all of their plugins and everything mm-hmm. like that, the sounds aren't I mean they're, they're ones and zeros. Right. So they're just a wall. There's like two that. good. You you don't go yeah. inside. There is no dynamic. You know, it's what it is. It might go louder and softer and have some kind of verb on it, but it's not like because somebody told me they said, "Man, I listened to and I was trying to think of the recording they listened to it was once something I did." And they were commenting because it was done back in the 90s. Mhm. And, of course, uh, you know, they were just listening. They said, my God, it was so big, and you could hear everything. And while you put the phones on, you were listening to landscape. You know, you heard mm-hmm. something through there and through there. Mm-hmm. And, of course. La- layers. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's molecular. Yeah. And I said, molecules magnetized are different than ones and zeros delegated to a frequency. That's really, really interesting because, I mean, you know, when I moved here in, you know, 97, everyone was still tracking in the same room at the same time. And I will say that about Nashville more than the other coasts. We are we're still doing that. We're still doing it. It is somehow being affected. Like I just did a session, you know, yesterday where so many tracks were on the grid and I knew that I didn't necessarily know what um, drum machine fills they were going to keep. So to play it safe, I played incredibly simple. 
You know, I didn't do any yeah, fills. And so you're just using the colors on the kit. Like, I'm going to play a tight hi hat here. I'm going to go to a loose hi hat here. Yeah. I'm going to go to a ride, making choices, but knowing I probably need to figure out how to stay out of the way to play it safe and make it easy for their editing. And so, like, the, the musical choices we're making now are different than when we were playing that big country in, right. in 1997, eight guys on the floor at the same time. I will say, thank God, thank God to Michael Knox and Jason Aldean and Pete Coleman and all the folks over at Treasure Isle, all the Aldean records, all at the same time. That's right. On the mm -hmm. floor at the same time. That's why they sound the way they do. They, they yeah, and they, they are. They're incredibly sounding. Mm -hmm. And they cre keep the legacy, mm -hmm. you know, from where I started back when all those records and everything that I did. And, and you know, then... Uh, my year so far, I've been able to enjoy because uh, Jim Ed Norman did a record on Dylan Scott. We were at Sound Emporium. We did that. Kyle Linning produced a three-day album on uh, Skip Ewing. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the floor, same thing. Yeah. You know? I'll, I'll, let me ask you this, guys. Professional yeah. drummers and, and players in the industry, you go back to an album like Van Halen 1984, yes. right? Um, Love it. I, I put that, when I was in radio, I was trying to actually do something with it and beat mix it with other songs and put it along with a <laughs> metronome. He is all over the flipping map yeah. as far as tempo. It just feels amazing. Right. But you, but don't, it feels you, don't, so you don't feel that. No, you don't. But what a band, and they're all doing right. it together. I listen to but a But here, here are some songs yeah. that just have legacy to them. You know they're going to be around for another 100 years. It's going to oh, be, well, time will tell to see you know, the lifespan of a bro a bro country record, like how long it's going to be around. Like, are we still going to be spinning it in 10 years? I'll right. say the same thing, you know. I mean, there's artists that we know, just like Jason now, is one of our treasures. Yeah. You mm -hmm. look out over the decades, and that will continue. And I guess, hypothetically, you wonder about anybody of the new that comes on and they're mm -hmm. doing what they do, will they be there in 25 years? It's almost like the mid-90s right now for country. Mid-90s rock yeah. was kind of like they were trying anything. You know, It was before the active rock genre was really defined. I was getting into radio at that particular moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, They were transitioning from grunge and Nirvana and, and the Seattle thing kind of was fizzling at that point. 94, 95, 96 was happening because I was in a cover band at the time playing drums. Jim also plays drums. Yeah. yeah. And we were playing, you know, Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, I don't think the Foo Fighters was out by then, but uh, uh, Everclear. Rage Against the Machine, sure. Everclear. Yeah. And it was just really wonky music. I mean, they were literally just throwing stuff up against the wall uh, to see if it sticks. You know, yeah. but oh, they're still playing a lot of it. Yeah, they play. They're, they're yeah. You go back. There's a lot of nostalgia for me when I listen to it. They call that classic rock now. Is it classic rock? Yeah, it's like it's like the young girls call it old timey music. Like, why are you listening to this old timey music when we is, can be listening to Drake? Is Journey old time? It's, it's oldies? Classic, you know, classic rock. Well, uh, uh, I'll tell you what. The reality of that is, just go on and check Foreigner Journey. Mm. Even Van Halen, check their tour schedule. <laughs> they are busy. busy. Yeah, yeah, really. Busy. And some of them don't even have like one original member. Some of them have one original member. Yeah, and they just get great side guys, and they hang the banner in the back, and it's a notable brand. And you, the people, ninety percent of the people in the audience, ninety nine percent of the people in the audience, just want to hear "Dirty White Boy" and "Double yeah. Vision" yeah. and "Cold as Ice." They don't care who's playing it. Yeah, you know. But it, but there is some God. There's there's wings to that music, and you're responsible for when Alan Jackson says we've gone country. Yeah, you know that was like what ninety two, ninety three, ninety four. Well, Pro before that. Yeah, it was like maybe like 91 or something? Yeah, Alan Jackson? probably, because Straight was uh, 84. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Straight, and, and you Straight, were, Straight, Straight so I'm so sorry. Straight has had, what, 60 number ones, and you've played on a, almost all of them? Probably 90%. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> Actually, more than that. So you can't, so folks, listen, you can't put your, you can't get in your car and turn on satellite XM or yeah. terrestrial radio and drive down the road to the Walgreens to do anything without hearing Eddie Bears on the radio. <laughs> right. That's pretty, that's got to be, does it still fun to hear yourself in a supermarket elevator um, the, on the radio? Or are you kind of over it? <laughs> does, it, does, it does it bring back a memory of that oh, session on no, that day? Absolutely. That's Anything like that that I hear and I'm going, oh my God, yeah, that was so-and-so, you know. Now, have you thought about writing a memoir? I have. 
Uh, but I just wouldn't know any of those fundamental beginnings of how you do that. So you need a co-author. Yes. Yeah, we got to get you a co-author. Um, but, I mean, we're just talking about the 90s. I mean, look at this track record. Jim, check this out. You being a drummer, you can appreciate this. Tanya Tucker, John Denver, Ricky Skaggs, George Strait, almost all the stuff. Garth Brooks, Glenn Campbell, Kenny Chesney, Vince Gill. Alan, so it goes on and on and on. Yeah. And talk about reinventing yourself, continuing to work, staying relevant, you're the house drummer at the Opry, right? Yes. As well. And then mm. our friend Mark subs for you, Mark Beckett. Yes. Now, when I see Mark Beckett play, I say to myself, that guy was heavily influenced by yep. Eddie Bears. I taught Does, him when he was 13. I mean, we're talking about wow. yeah. he's a lefty. Yep. The same setup. Yep. A, 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 like a, a, your brand, I hear it. Yeah. Not that he's not a unique individual Well, you know person, his dad, but, the infamous Barry Beckett. Yeah. Famous all producer. All those records that, yeah, producer that we did, Barry would always bring home. Uh, the tracks and everything that we recorded. What a great education. Yes. So he would get those to Mark, and Mark would just... Play along. Yeah, play along with those, and that's what he did. So he's actually now, every once in a while, he go, man, do you remember this? And it'd be like, because obviously Barry was diverse, so we did a, a heavy metal artist, Dora Pesh, from Germany. Mm -hmm. So it was like double kicks, you know, yeah. and uh, Dan Huff and everything. And I think then, a lot of people would be surprised to, to, to hear you play that style. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know. Exactly. I mean, I've got, when you put the records on, and they just sound phenomenal. Was it like a speed metal kind of thing? It, it, yeah, it was like, like. There was a few cuts like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Really? Wow. And the two kicks. Yeah. Are you still playing with the players? That's your side project. Well, you know what? John Hobbs, our keyboard player. I started that band in 2001 because there was a friend I had from CMT and CBS Cable named Martin Clayton, who's since retired. And he had courted me. We had met each other, and uh, I can't remember how we ever did it. It might have been a Neris thing. But anyway, we got to talking about ideas and everything and creating shows. So the first thing we did was a Christmas special with Glenn Campbell. And basically, our format was going to be, yeah, we'll go in and record a record. Uh, we'll film, you know, Glenn singing the songs with guests or maybe not guests, and then sell, which we did. Uh, after that was done, he said, you know, what about like a music-based thing? And I said, well, I wouldn't want it to be like a American Music Shop thing, you know, with the musicians. I said, what about if we did a musician-artist record? Mm -hmm. So with that, we said, yeah, great, put a band together. So I put together Brent Mason, Paul Franklin, Michael Rhodes, and John Hobbs. And the, pre the premise of that record was we got we brought in Vince Gill, Peter Frampton, uh, Travis Tritt, uh, Sean Colvin. So that was a diverse. Yeah. But what happened after that show and DVD and everything was done, it stuck. So we just became brothers in arms with that. And we played around for like 11 years. And then John since retired. And it was obvious, as somebody would say, even in a band sense, uh, you know, well, are you going to get somebody to take his place? I said, no, this is it. The players are it. Right. And so we just let that rest. And everybody's kind of like in their own world and what they do. But, of course, we're still connected. Yeah, sure. You know, very, very heavily, in fact, uh, in October, we'll really be it. I, you know, I used to come see you guys play at Third and Lindsley all the time. If there's any Nashvillians that listening, you guys know the original Third and Lindsley was this small room, and that's then, right. And then Ron knocked the wall down and expanded, and but blew that little it. small room it was magic. Oh god, it really was. Yeah, the mm -hmm. band is in the I corner, mean, and, oh, the, man. and got the pinball machines in the back by the dressing yes. room, and you know it's pretty good uh, bar food, and you know, yeah, you know, Ron, exactly. the owner, is a he's, he's a fan of music. You know, he yeah. there's always great acts in there regional acts national acts, oh yeah local acts yeah he supports them you know people always ask me all the time i'm coming to nashville where should i go i say okay third and lindsley yeah 12th and porter douglas corner the sutler the that's basement right. that's right lower broadway and they say no what's your favorite spot on lower broadway rich i say well you got to go to world famous tootsies because yeah you just have to and um i like 
Robert's Western World because it's like the real old school yeah. Don Kelly band and the old country guys play and they're wearing the nudie suits and they're wearing yeah. the, the shirts and you can go in there and you get your crinkle fries and your Coors original in <laughs> the bottle and maybe some fr <laughs> fried bologna sandwich, That's buy a pair of boots. That's where we are. We, we are so health oriented you know we really go after the health food <laughs> fried yeah. bologna tofu it's a tofu welcome bologna. to the south totally. so so you it was it's very well known for those of you who are listening at one point and probably still this way it was like a handful of people like a, a, a fraternity of two or three guys that you always heard on the same stuff that was a sense, like in the voiceover business, which is where I live most of the time. You're talking about the A team in Nashville that Eddie was right, right. Yeah. We, were, we referred to before. Uh, for that, like you know, the movie trailer guys who voiced all the movie trailers, you know, in oh. the world, those guys, Don LaFontaine, Don LaFontaine, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was like four or five people doing all the all the work. And you know, yeah. how, what was your kind of view on that for somebody coming in? Because I remember hearing an interview with Don LaFontaine. They said, "Well, was, you know, someone asked him. I said he, he, he was he was very tongue in cheek, uh, funny guy." Yeah. <clears throat> they said, "You know, there was only four or five of you, from what I understand." He goes, "Yes, as it should be." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He says, "You know, there's only like five of you making all the money." He's like, "Yes, as it should be." <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's great. Well, I mean, your attitude, I guess, was a little different. I mean, did you care? And you were a part of that fraternity. Was that something that you? Well, you know, the fraternity really, and that, and that day from the '80s to '90s, it was really under production mm -hmm. because the way it was, which is different in today's world. Uh, let's say Brent Mayer produced an act that we did. We did the demos on the Judds, and then they go through the roof. Well, then the label Joe Galani or RCA said. We want you to produce this, and we want you to produce that. So under one producer, I'd have four mm. major artists that I would be playing on. Mm -hmm. And the same thing when Jimmy Bowen came to town. Uh, you know, he tested me out. He said, you're going to be my guy. And that, talk about a windfall. Now, that was the same crew mm -hmm. for a good 10, 11 years. And what it did, not from my efforts, but because he just controlled this world and produced everybody here because he ran the label too. Yeah. So uh, with that, I mean, uh, a good example would be like, so this is August, I would be booked through next August. That's wow. incredible. Every week. And that you were doing two, three sessions a day. Oh, sometimes. Two, two sessions a day Yeah. And, and five days a week. And then if they had to squeeze up, man, it'd be a Saturday. Mm -hmm. But again, it was every artist. So because of that, you have an amazing pension <laughs> <laughs> with the union. Well, <laughs> let's hope that it survives. Yeah. Well, yeah. if it can, yeah. Uh, you know, and I think it will. Yeah. I think it might get cut, but it'll, it'll be it'll survive. Yeah. The, but I think the uh, the stats were, and for a lot of us that were with Bowen for those 10 years because he controlled the world, <laughs> you know, uh, I would have, uh, see the top 11 singles for six and a half months in Billboard and the top 13 albums in country in Billboard. Yeah. For like six months, you just look and, you know, just be amazed. You know, the, the one thing I never did was absorb it into like, yeah, you know. I, I was going to ask. I knew yeah. what it was. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if this guy that you're working for is doing everybody that's on those charts, well, obviously. That's, well, that speaks incredibly to the power of relationships. Well, and I guess what we're saying as far as the the nucleus of every one of those camps, I had it with Brent Mayer. I had it with Jimmy Bowen. Barry Beckett, when he left Muscle Shoals came out, and he was seeking out somebody for his Nashville rhythm section, which I was blessed to be able to be in that. So that was another 10 years of him producing everything internationally. I mean, we did from Seeger, and I mean, all these uh, uh, different artists like Brendan Croker, who was with the Nottingham Hillbillies and stuff. So it was really good at diverse music. But I guess back to the question, there wasn't a nucleus. It was just who was ever in those production camps but you were mm -hmm. in with everybody which really speaks well, to like wow 
people have their faith in your ability to show up and deliver the job. And I'm sure they knew you, they like you, they trusted you, yeah. and you showed up consistently. So for the viewers out there and listeners that uh, that aren't in the music business, a recording session is from 10 to 1, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and then a short lunch break, and you might have to go to another recording session across town with another set of drums set up, and you would record from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. That's correct. And this is all kind of governed by the American Federation of Musicians, which says that you have to make this amount of money in this amount of time, and it adds up, and they pay into your pension. And it was it was like the golden age of the music oh, business. Oh, totally. Where Absolutely. now it is the Wild West. There's so many things happening off the card. Yeah, and, a, bunch, um, a bunch off the card. You know, and... and uh, you know, what would your advice be? Because I know you, you mentor, you have, you're have you involved with the Grammys and you go speak at Berkeley. Yeah. And so you have a young kid. His parents are spending $250,000, $300,000 for the kid to go to Berkeley right. and graduate with a piece of paper. And they go, wow, now I'm going to go into the music business. i got to pay back these student loans. Um, wow. How am I going to do this? What advice would you give to a 22-year-old kid graduating from one of the top music schools or somebody that's just self-trained and they know that they have to be in New York, L.A. or Nashville? Let me, let me ask something real yeah. quick. Yeah. Are you still paying off your student loans? <laughs> <laughs> no? I actually, because of the Peralta College system, I went free. There that's you go. Incredible. If you were a resident <clears throat> around Oakland and San Francisco, you could get your double A free. That's incredible. Yeah. You ever miss California in your time there? Not now. Yeah. <laughs> not, yeah. not, not, the, not now, not Oakland now. No, 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 oh, yeah. no, no, no. I watched it deteriorate. Yeah. I mean, within years after I left. Yeah. That was a shame. Yeah. But, but you know, I and I get those questions a lot because what I do is I work with a couple of professors at Berkeley. So every year they bring down like 125 students. We have a week that we program all the hierarchy here that encompass every facet. I mean, you're going to have publishing, uh, label, management, legal, and then musical, songwriting, and all that. And, of course, they all have, you know, the same questions And as far as when they get out and what they do. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be the same thing now, even with your success of where you evolve to where you are You'd have to ask yourself the same question. What would you say? Yeah. You know? Roll up your sleeves, find the people that mm. are doing what you want to do, meet them, model yourself after them. Emulate. Emulate. Yeah, mm -hmm. The only thing I, advice I give them is I said, I know sometimes you guys can be separate from each other in whatever facet mm -hmm. uh, and have your own little core, your only core group the there that you do. Yeah. I said, break that down network with each other i said because that songwriter or that uh guy who's going to be in publishing or anything like that might give you a call mm -hmm. and say you know uh encompassing our publishing company we're going to start a production studio you know would you you know and that, this is how a lot of my uh contacts happen did you understand what you were doing at the time though when when you were doing it did you, or just, you know, no. it just happened. No, yeah, you know, all I did is after a while with the, with the experience, you put it together. Mm -hmm. You start saying, wow, oh, I mean, that's how it happened. He, uh, Don Cook, he called and took me into Acuff Rose and then moved me over to Tree and Don Gant, mm -hmm. Buddy Killen, and all that. And then you start going, oh, I get it. You know, so. This is how and that's and, and I guess it's, the, there's also, uh, when you talk about Lower Broad, you know, and people who come down get into the jams and stuff like that. Yeah. I said, a lot of those people who come down and play, uh, sometimes they're also in the network of the studios, mm -hmm. doing the demos, whatever whatever they might you be. You never know who's gonna be there. And they might hear you and go, mm -hmm. man, uh, let me have your number. I mean, yeah. I mean, every time you play your instrument or work on your craft in public, you are advertising your business. That's exactly Do you think right. they understand that though? I mean, I remind you, them all you've the been time. To, you've been told, I don't want to play, I don't need to play lower broad. Well, there's a lot of kids that are moving to town that are just like, they maybe they save smartly, they save money, and they don't necessarily need to work a day job, so they just go out every night and crash parties and meet people, but they're like, you know, I don't want to go play for tips. I was like, hey, I didn't either, but I learned so much and, so quickly. And, and, and again, that one person... Mm -hmm. that you might befriend through that who goes, man, let me have your number. Mm 
-hmm. And the next thing you know, you get the call. Sure. You know, and that's that's the beauty of in in networking, and that's what I always advise. You got to get in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, relationships. Absolutely. Oh, that was your advice to me. You know, uh, we'll see you in town. Get involved with the community, you know, looking forward to having you here, which was great. And I can't believe that was, what's 365 days times 24? That was a long time ago. Was, you know, and, and look at my band. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was meeting those two individuals that introduced me to a young Jason Aldean, that introduced me to their producer. And we're five presidencies later, we're still be in the trenches creating yeah. bringing the music to the people that was a real gift people always ask me like how did that happen was it an audition i was like really it was your same path it was relationships with people well and and to to back that up it's like when people come in and say well what i'd like to do is be able to get in you no know, some, some audition you know and i would have to tell them i said let me tell you something most core bands of artists if they have somebody who's leaving, the other musicians know who they'd like to. They're calling a friend. Yeah. Yeah. They'd like to know who, who, who do you, who do you know? Who, and, and everybody will have their own little side of, uh, let's get him and him and him and try him out. So it's not going to be like a resume. Mm -hmm. you know, or let's do auditions. We just know yeah, somebody. It's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, the Which only you... thing that could possibly happen is if there's a new artist on the horizon and maybe their management might reach out to somebody like me, anybody like that. Hey, do you know some people that might want to blah, 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 any young drummers, any young guitar players, stuff like that. That might happen. It doesn't happen that much, you know. But, but like you were talking about Lower Broad, yeah. Yeah. it was the same thing. 18 years ago, I, I, I couldn't be working any more than I was. But then... I got a call from John Gardner who said he's going out on the road with the Dixie Chicks. He said, would you surrogate for me at the Opry? He said, I'm going to be gone six months. I said, absolutely. I'll be happy to do that, which yeah. I loved. It was legacy and everything there. Uh, when I did that, I enjoyed it, you know. Uh, what's interesting is the same people that told you is people come and go, man, I don't know. You know I mean, the Opry, uh, there's a stigma there, you know, mm. grand. Oh, yeah. It was looked look frowned upon mm. if you if you and, played it huh if, if you played the if, opera if you was the house drummer. well if you were in the house oh, okay. you know what yeah. i mean but people know that you're doing that so anyway when john got back it turns out they're going to do a three-month european tour and then at that time general manager came and they said we're not going to have him back if you want the gig it's yours i said i do I, i'll take it i said but i can't do every week so i want to hire somebody to alternate weeks with so i hired paul lime and he, he did it for several years and then he said i'm going to leave and so then i said well mark beckett I was so gonna... this was 18 years ago you've been doing that in addition to all your other session yeah, work yeah, and everything absolutely. and what is the time commitment tuesdays and s it well now we're tuesday friday tuesday wednesday friday saturday wow oh, wow and starting september we'll go five five nights tuesday wednesday thursday friday saturday but just like last night you know, uh, you guys are, or, or you guys are reading charts. I, I, I do these young artists. I mean, they're, they're, they're young, but they're incredibly talented, like Maggie Rose. Mm -hmm. uh, a new Ever. artist last night, which was Haley Witter. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole thing about it. And, of course, like you say, not as much bro country in their way, but, I mean, it's intricately done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, with a, a, a drum machine that playing inhuman beats. Right, <laughs> and, right, right. And... It's like, okay, well, I don't have that loop, but I can replicate as close as I can. Sure. You know, to it. What you do, and it's amazing, some of the artists who really don't have that production control appreciate it because of, wow, it felt so great. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah and, and now, what, like, what is what is that typical uh, night at the opera? You might, you've got a cast of characters that are coming through. you got this awesome house band. Of course, you're reading charts, yeah. and you, uh, someone sends you an MP3, or, and then you reference it so you kind of know it's happening, and then time to go. Yeah, it's usually within a day. Like my, I won't know until maybe tonight, what music I got to learn for Friday and Saturday, mm -hmm. but it'll be uploaded to an Opry band site with the MP3s there. And then, uh, 
we pretty well delegate Larry Paxson. He is our chart meister. Yeah. He's There's a, always one guy that's the fastest. Oh, man. He, but, but it's so <laughs> articulate, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and he charts everything out. You download the MP3, boom, boom, mark it up, and go play. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's within a 24-hour period that you learn yep. all the songs. And like on Tuesday and Wednesdays, it's what they call a non-hosted like maybe somebody like announcer Bill Cody is the host, every artist gets three songs. Mm -hmm. So if you have four artists, you've got 12 songs to learn. Mm -hmm. Bill's so, such a cool guy too, man. Oh, I need great. He is a nice guy. You're, oh, you're, you're earning your, you know, and that's, you're working that craft. I mean, right behind this very wall here, there's a closet and there's filing cabinets full of every Nashville number chart or phrase chart or drum chart I have performed in the last 24 oh, really? years. That's Serious? Incredible. That's really? incredible. Yeah. yeah, I've saved everything. Why? That's good. Uh, I don't know. Just like, a, you know, I know for sure I eventually want to... Um, it keeps you humble. I want to do like an, uh, like an Aldine songbook where it's like, here's the number chart I was given at 10 a.m. Yeah. This is the marked up number chart with the notes that I made on it. And then this is the transcription oh my of the song of what I actually perfect, played. Perfect. You've got gold sitting in there, man. Well, I tried, right? to, I tried to have a... Um, uh, a young student of mine like sign up like to, uh, to put it together mm -hmm. and he's like this is a lot of work old man and so he, <laughs> he abandoned the project so if there's any listeners out there that want to be involved any interns, college students you want to put this project together i will give you full credit maybe i'll even cut you in on the profits yeah. co-authorship right that's right well because now i mean obviously everyone's schooled so larry knows that if there's something intricately incorporated like synchronized licks and things that you have to go with, like a da 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 da. da, da. Mm -hmm. He He'll writes it out. He, and he writes all that out. Right. And and if it's something between that syncopation, that quarterly has to be played to that, he writes the number to each one of those notes, so that who's ever reading it can learn it from that way and know. Oh, this is where yeah. we go. Da, 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 you know right. and see this is why i'm better off as a voiceover artist and not a professional drummer because you're speaking hieroglyphics to no, me no right no it be you know because if you've ever read the ted reed syncopation for the modern drummer i got to like page four and 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 there's a lot of you know band leaders in town chart guys yep. that write charts and if there's an intricate lick they just write lick mm -hmm. right but that's not them, you know because some of the new artists who have a band leader yeah uh, they said, okay, the MP3's up there, and they sent a chart. Mm -hmm. And you look at the chart and go, that's sad. You got to do my own. Then I wrote, I write my own. Yeah. So yeah. charts are kind of open to interpretation. They can be subjective. Well, there's different types of charts. Say there's like a there's like a cruise ship type chart, <coughs> where it's it's Western notation right. at, with drum set notation. Then we have the Nashville number system, which is basically outlines the harmonic structure of a song, which is what you're going to get on a. A recording session yeah. in Nashville or at the Grand Ole Opry. And then there's, um, you know, classical Western notation where it's the notes are all on the staff. We yeah. don't really get that very much in Nashville. No, they no. get that in New York and L.A. And then there's a drum chart or a phrase chart, which is where I like to live a lot because I can put more drum information in exactly. there. Exactly. Or there's a hybrid, like on the Aldine session, we're referencing a... Um, we're referencing an MP3 of the demo. We have the number chart, and then any drum information that I want, I write above the numbers. And you can do that. Yeah. Which is basically what we do. Mm -hmm. But people don't realize because they always claim, oh, so and so with whatever uh, group it was in, it came up with the number system. And of course, when I saw that, I went, no, because I knew in college there was a, a known educator bass player named John Mahagan, and he came up with a numerical system, but it was done in Roman numerals. And he could spell out the chord yeah. with the Roman numerals. Yeah. Huh. You know. And the, wasn't it Elvis's backing singers that came up with the Nashville number system? It was one of the, let me think, the Jordan Airs? That sounds right. So you're right. Yes. You're right, exactly. Yeah. I think uh, one of those guys, maybe his name was Neil, it escapes me, but yeah, he... He may, uh, I mean, he did come up with it where you just actually use the numbers comparatively to Roman numerals. Sure. You know, but yeah. it was still an innovation on that thing. Totally. Can we talk about hard truths, right? We talked about what somebody needs to know coming into town, right? Yes. 
When I went to broadcasting school, there was one teacher that we had that laid down a hard truth that I'll never forget. And he said, if you're not willing to move in this business, you might want to consider not getting into it. And it was one of those things where all of us were singing. The, and the, the dude just laid it on the line. You mean moving to an Moving epicenter? to other markets. Yeah. You know? He says, if you want to move up in this business you're, you, and you're not willing to move, you might want to find something else to do. Yeah. And, and I was like, holy crap. You know, well, I've lived in Connecticut all my mm-hmm. life, and I'm sitting there at 22, 21 years old at yeah. the time going, holy crap, I'm going to have to move from Connecticut. That's not such a bad thing, but I never really thought I would have to do that. <laughs> and, and, and that's interesting because one of the things that I always talk about when somebody says, the advice, what advice? Mm-hmm. I said, wipe genre out of your mind. Because if you want to make a living and work in this business, you don't know. I mm-hmm. mean, everything that you so uphold of this is, oh, this this is brain music. This is so far greater than blah, blah, blah. I said, then all of a sudden you're cutting yourself out. Because you don't know that that jazz fusion group that you were in, or rock fusion group that breaks up, and all of a sudden there's a country opening and a country ban, what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. If you have to make a living, if you're paying your bills with that. And I said, overall, let's look at the reality of this. I said, you don't condescend to humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry, but- Interesting. The person who delivers your mail, uh, paves the road, roofs your house, just fixes your plumbing, all that. And I'm sorry, they're, they're not privy to your state of art. Yeah. Mm. So the simplicity of what they want to listen to is either from fun or it's for somebody or a crafted songwriter that is putting words in that you will hear that, that are saying what you would want to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whether it's love, whether it's, you know, who knows what it is. Oh, we need songwriters and the whole culture right. of Nashville runs and, on it. And uh, the whole thing is it doesn't need to be genre specific. Yeah. You know, so mm-hmm. I, I always really want them to understand that. You know, because you don't know. For sure. Let's just say hypothetically that you were, oh, no, I, I just love this big band and this is what I want to do, everything like that. And then all of a sudden. Limited uh, yeah. limited. But you, you you had a very healthy, open mind. You oh, understood I, you would have to be so very yeah, and That's good. And you know what? You can yeah. detect that. It's yeah. like I could detect that even when we were conversing. You know, and again, it's the same kind of thing. And I'm sure now, my God, the network that you're doing now, God bless you yeah. for that. Because uh, I came to one of those, uh, it was a damn thing, was it about two or three years ago? Oh. The, we were over at uh, the sound check. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, the drummer's weekends. Yeah, yeah drummer's yeah, weekend. Yeah. And I just saw that and I went, oh, it, this is so incredible. You know, so in a sense, it is like passing on and giving, you mm-hmm. know, and nurturing. And well, I was nurtured. So it's our, it's, it's our responsibility for any successful person to continue mentoring and to inspire a future generation. Share what you've learned. Help. And you know, one of our guests on our, our, my other podcast, Pick Rich's Brain, is, was my student, Sarah Cardeal. And she's the real deal, Sarah Cardeal. And she's just like a student of the drums and so focused and so wants to do it. So she, um, she goes, can you introduce me to Liberty DeVito? Can you introduce me to Mark Shulman? Can you introduce me to Kenny? I'm like, of course. That's the one thing I was going to bring up before, the networking aspect of it. Right. She's actually asking for warm referrals, which is something in, you know, I do a lot of business networking. And we're taught on on how ways to ask for warm, hey, could you give me a warm introduction to somebody? I, you know, and okay, am I going to be able to put my neck on the line for somebody? It's a, yeah, asking you, know, you shall receive. Right. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. she asks a lot. She unapologetically, and that's yeah. good. That's good. Fa- it is fantastic. Yeah. Well, fantastic. I guess my point was is that still, there's something innate in you that the person that is wanting to know, yeah. uh, you pretty well have a, an idea. Yeah. Of who they are, you know, that's just an in, innate Bible because we're so energy motivated. Yes, and you can tell if that person has it. Yeah, you yeah. I, I ran into a guy the other day, an old friend of mine actually, and he does a certain blue collar trade. I'm not going to mention what kind it is, but he, um, you know, I said, look, there, I've got a project for you. That I can hand off to you. Are you interested in quoting this? He's like, well, what is it? And I said, well, it's this kind of a project. Nah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, God, God bless him. Yeah. I mean, you you recommended me the guy to get this sign made, and he came and he did it in record time, and it's like you know, awesome. And but, it's like we need these guys. I, but the funny I, thing, what my point is, is I that can't do plum. I'm not a plumber. But I mean, if somebody you know, like, hey, I've got business I want to give you. I yes. know your capabilities, yes. but I'm not going to give it to you all the time if you're going to start turning. Really? 
you know, yeah. you're not even going to look into it. Take the word. Take you the know word. what I mean? Do you come across that as well from, from you know, you guys come across that from, from people? Well, you know, I'm, it's not really my thing, you know. or It's uh, happening more often these days. I mean, yeah. if, if when I moved here when I was 27 years old and somebody offered me a job playing the drums, no matter what it paid, I did it. You did it. Yeah, that's exactly I right. I did it. And no job was too small. And if literally I'm playing a restaurant and the and the guy wants me to learn 60 songs by the next day i'm going to learn all 60 songs i'm going to write them out because you never know who's going to be in that band who's going to walk in the room and hear us playing how about that the Mm -hmm. guy with the yes the the cigar goes hey kid (laughs) and that's what i was hoping would happen to me in dallas texas yeah and it never happened so i knew i had to go to new york la or nashville and i got that audition with trisha i got that audition with um Dina Carter, I got that audition with Barbara Mandrell, and the writing was on the wall. They're like, kid, you sound great, yeah. but you but, don't live here. Yeah, hard and truth. You must be present to win. So like when you're talking about broadcast, yeah, you realize you would have to move to a market, but to, yeah. to play an instrument or to be in the big leagues in the music business, there's only three cities. That's true. There's three cities, and and New York is even questionable because you, you're you going to be playing Broadway, right? right. Which is, right. you know, you're going to play... 13 shows a week of cats and you're going to live in New Jersey or Connecticut and have to commute in. Right. That doesn't sound like fun to me. Uh, And, or you're going to be playing in wedding and bar mitzvah bands. Yes. And, and so like, I think a lot of people are moving to Nashville because it is one of the last places where the music business is thriving. That's true. And, and I know a lot of my friends who have podcasts who are drummers, who are creatives, they always want to talk a little bit about this. And it's something that a lot, a lot of people have talked about in the past. And that is, you had all those years of major earnings. What do you do as a creative when you start to make a little bit of money? What do you do with your money? What do you do? Do you buy real estate? Do you do stocks? What, what advice would you give to a 23-year-old kid that starts to make money? Well, first, uh, don't live beyond your means. Right. Uh, and try to do it so that if, if what you're earning at that point is just maintaining then that's fine. If things start when falling for you, yeah, real estate. Mm-hmm. There's nothing, they won't make any more of it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And Unless that's what I did. Fresh waterfront property in California. Yeah. So I'm probably like dining and or doing business at a bunch of places that Eddie Bears owns in no, Nashville. No, <laughs> not, no, but, but one of the first things I did when I came in and I could afford I didn't buy a house. I bought a duplex, mm-hmm. and I rented out the other side. Perfect. You, you were such a. You, you're so far. Ahead. You were. You were visionary. If you're thinking that way. Yeah. A lot of that yeah. is our upbringing. Yeah. You know because yeah. there's uh, not many people that think that way now. Oh no, you know? no. I would, and unfortunately, I knew some that when oh they hit the big time. Yeah. You know, triple six figures and all like like that, and all of a sudden they're building. Seven hundred thousand dollar homes. Yeah, I said, you, you know, know, you don't want to go ahead unless you know you don't have to go back. Mm-hmm. You know, make sure that every move that you make, that you can do that. You know, so, uh, or or you can justify the payment on it. Have something that cash flows the payment. Mm-hmm. Well, you can justify it, but let make sure that you're you have a mindset to say I can make the payment because right now I have this job. Well, and if anything, you and, see a lot of people. And out what there, if I don't? Yeah. There's a lot of people out there that you know the the bottom falls out. Okay, now what? And there's so you know people I, are selling I, stuff. I know a couple of our guys. Mm-hmm. I would certainly not mention their name, but I know a couple of guys who planned on that. They'd been with major artists mm-hmm. for uh, 17, 18 years, and mm-hmm. all of a sudden it's done. Yep. And you would only hope that during that time, did you put away a nest really, egg? Did you save? Did you invest? You know correctly. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that you can exist after this. Now, you're talking about John Hobbs retiring. Yeah. That's, you know, I think more about that the older I get. I mean, I'm like a high energy guy. I'm always going somewhere. I'm going, you're the same way. Is that going to happen? Are you going to retire? No. Me? Yeah. You oh, love what God. you do. No. Why? What do you, like, I don't play golf. You know? I did retire. <laughs> and and the only statement anybody made, I retired over 10 years ago. From the union. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. But the only thing i I have a friend that just said, I'm glad you retired so you can do all this work you're doing. <laughs> but no, you know what? And people even talk about longevity, and I'm sure both of you in every facet can appreciate. 
the one thing about it, every morning when you get up and you realize, you know what? You either get to do a voiceover, you get to do this podcast, you get to go play, you're going to be out and doing and teach and do everything like that. I get to get to call, I can go to the Opry, I can do my session. Uh, there is not a given day that I am not in love mm. with that, never. And I, there's just no way that I could ever envision myself getting to a point of going, nah, I don't want to do that, you know. And I've seen the adverse of that where some people, because work diminished to a certain point, where they become depressed. Mm -hmm. Their know? identity is gone. Yeah. And th they, they were living in that high time and everything like that. And it's not even that they can't exist after that, but they're depressed because they're not doing that anymore. Right. You know. And it's tough to get a gig. Yeah. Yeah. Which, so. which I... You know, if that time comes, I accept that, you know. Mm -hmm. Luckily, when I talk about the stigma of the Opry, it, it was funny. People would, oh, man, you don't want to do that. I'm telling you, people are going to start stigmatizing you about being an Opry drummer and all that. Yeah, but you got the equity that's building up to that. Well, what's funny mm -hmm. is in the past three or four years, they're the ones that call me and go, hey, man, if you ever need a sub. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're changing, you're, you're shifting the perception of the Opry drummer. Well, I mean, you know? I remember when I... Well, the, you know what? The artistry, the, the general management, when Pete Fisher took over, diversified the artistry that came on. Subsequent to him was Sally Williams, who's now is leaving, but we got Dan Rogers. But they always brought in social media stars. Mm -hmm. So there was such a diverse uh, group. When you look at the lineups at the Opry and you're going, wow. You know, and you look at even the Opry stars now. We got Kelsey Ballerina, That's Oprah incredible. Medicine Show. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I remember when I, w I used to play several times a month with Pam Tillis. Yeah. you know, and I would, you know, I'd have to. You'd get up and, you know, if there's any musicians out there, the Opry drum chair is so interesting because literally it's like, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's show is brought to you by Martha White Flower, and you've yeah. got 30 seconds to get on the drum set. There's a hydraulic throne. You can't be precious. It's nope. like you just got to get on, and then boom, the, you're, you got your wedge, and it's just nothing but steel guitar, and you can't hear the vocal, and you're just yeah. like, all well, right, we, we, we got to do this. We saw each other there last year. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to do it. And yeah. I'm like, I'm high-fiving you, Yeah, and then and I do my thing, and then you get off, and you got to get on and get the show. It's the longest-running radio show in history. history oh yeah yeah and and so you know you changed you know uh recorded history with all your body of work retired you have security <laughs> you have a legacy and now you go into your second part of your life for 18 years yeah. in that seat you're crushing it yeah you're but you changing know, history again the, the funny thing is is that there was a time where because i worked in vegas for four years and for cbs radio and there was a time that if you took up a residency in vegas as an artist it was basically where you went to die right okay and, and we're doing one this year but the funny but here's the thing celine dion they built her an actual you know space the the coliseum at, at caesar's palace back in 02 or so and she did her show there she had a residency uh, but I think she shifted the perception of that same way that you're doing. Because, hey, I can make my own choices. I don't need to do this. I'm doing this because I want to do this. Yeah. So the perception of it is probably changing. And I think overall, know. it's like, oh, it, now Rich and Jason Odin are going to take residency. Well, no, that's been the lay of the land there for years. You know, yeah. like you said, Celine did it. Marie and Donnie did it. Mm -hmm. uh, Olivia Newton did it. And she would take one on and one off with uh, Donnie and Marie. She'd do a month, they would do a month at the Flamingo, you know, and, mm -hmm. and alternate that. And like with me, the word retirement uh, was just a word, you know, yeah. because I'm not doing anything different than I've done for over 50 years. Well, you know, our buddy Russ Paul, I do sessions with him all the time. He's retired. Yeah. And, but he's working every day. Yeah. You know. Um, but when, whenever I receive something, it's, it's interesting because, and, you know, you mentioned the players. Are, uh, the five of us are going in the Musicians Hall of Fame. That's incredible. In That's October. Awesome. Congrats. But but the thing about it is, is when I was put into the Country Music Hall of Fame Nashville Cat Series, mm -hmm. what drunk cost my mind, I'm in there and your peers are in there. It's an hour and a half, you know, and Bill Lloyd's asking you this question. I mean, they're pulling things out that you go, 
holy mackerel, where did you find that? You know. <laughs> uh, but as it's going on about midstream, I start thinking, hey, can I just say something? Uh, I still, I'm still working. Yeah. You know, yeah, this, this isn't is a, a gold museum. watch. This is not yeah. a gold watch here. Right. You know? <laughs> it's really, it's really be funny. Like you know, I, I have this studio here, which is it's nice to be uh, creative and have a creative space, even if it's just five hundred square feet. To just call your own, throw a Persian rug on the floor, and play some drums. Yeah. This house that this studio is connected to, I have three young drummers that are that are in the place, and and when I moved out, I decorated the place with mem my memorabilia. So like all sorts of press clippings and interesting little things from my life. And I framed them all. They're like, Rich, this place is like a museum. It's like a, it's like a red <laughs> museum. It's a shrine to know. Rich. It's really weird. I was like, yeah, it is kind of weird now, guys. But it was just a really <laughs> affordable way to decorate. But um, but yeah, we, we you know, we're alive. We're kicking. We're moving. We're, I want to stay relevant. I'm changing, growing, yeah. um, different things are are happening you know put right that's your book i am so excited to give this to you oh, thank you and it's like i'm too young to write a memoir you need to write one because you're the right age to write a memoir we're going to get you a co-author and you're okay. going to crank out that book and people are going to love it but this is just my take on what i know about the world and drumming and people and we talked about relationships and that's a big part of of the crash philosophy oh, totally big time that's huge wonderful so um, is there anything that uh, you want to just like leave out there in the world and just say on this particular day about the state of the music industry or where you're going with your career? You, you know what? I mean, um, I guess in perspective, because I know there's always a lot of controversy when it comes to the music today, comparatively to that, you know, and whenever you talk about, well, country music isn't country music anymore. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, guess what? Rock and roll isn't boogie woogie either. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's been innovations on all genres you that come through. But I mean, you know, even back in the day with the train beats, that was an, an adaptation of a previous generation as well. Of course. You know? And when you really think of so called uh, rock and roll, when they think of uh, some of the people like Bill Haley, Little Richard, stuff like that. I said, you know, I was doing music for a, a play out of Canada, and it was about Hank Sr. Mm -hmm. And I started le learning all the songs and everything, and there was one song, when you think about how long ago, called Move It On Over. Yep. And you know the song? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but the, the structure of that song, move it on over because the big dog's moving in. Mm -hmm. I mean... That's rock and roll. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Early rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, talking about train beats, you're like on a Johnny, a Johnny Cash song, like do -ta -ka -do -ka -ta, real light yeah. with brushes or light sticks on the edge of the snare drum. And then Eddie comes along in the 90s and he's got <laughs> rim, <laughs> rim shots and yeah. gated reverb and <laughs> the, the, the drums are like right here in the mix. And then the Shania Twain records come around and Paul Lyme's got 80... They choose 80 snare drums to yeah. figure out the best snare drums, and it's like a Def Leppard record. Things grow, change, and evolve. Yeah, yeah they do. You know, yeah. so we just we just are either going to be left behind or we're moving forward. Well, and the innovations on our, our enhancements. You know, I really started years ago when I was with Brent Mayer, and we did the Judd records. We did Michael Johnson, uh, actually a record on Richard Perry. Uh, but Brent and I started putting brains together about triggering things. Sure. So we basically took PCMs, and when I first became aware of the Lindrum, we were able to innovate in there and fire those samples off mm -hmm. with... The piezo triggers. Yeah. yeah. So, so the kick drum and the toms on, like a, there's a song that I'm noted for, was called That's That uh, from uh, Michael Johnson. Uh, then the Judd records, when you hear them, it's the same thing. And so in a sense, because when people say, well, sample, samples, I said, yeah, but that's like a verb, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it is. Because I started using a Simmons 5 without the stereotype, mm -hmm. you know, just, but the... Mm -hmm. tch, tch. Yes. And that triggering those was a, a, an enhanced verb per mm -hmm. se. So all those things that I would innovate on and, and come up with my own method of doing anything that technically would come out and if i heard it 
and I didn't know it, uh, I would learn it. Yeah. You know, where some people were adverse going, nah, I don't ever want to get into that. I remember buying my first drum cat. It was a thousand bucks. I was like, oh my God, at the time it was like, that could have been $10,000 at the time, <laughs> right? But I, got, I was like, oh, I have a drum cat, right? And then moving through a Yamaha <laughs> sampler sequencer and and now like all this cat. gear that we would learn, mm -hmm. these with all the knobs and everything, it's like the same technology in like a like a Keurig coffee yeah. maker. You well, know, the, for the layman that have never heard of a drum cat, it was a it was a, a a surface that the rubber pads had the shape of a cat's head. Exactly, yes. had ears on it and stuff. Well, there's what? the first thing that comes to your mind. I'm going to ask a question. We got to we'll wrap yeah. it up. Sure. Um, just instant response. The favorite song you've ever played on. I was about to say that. It's got to be pretty hard to. First do. one that comes to mind. First one that comes to mind is that's that, mm -hmm. Michael Johnson. Michael Johnson, that's that. Yes. Can people can people find that? Oh, they yeah. can find it. Okay, it, because uh, the way the song was structured, it was like a deceptive. You think you know where the feel of the song is, mm -hmm. and by our inspiration, at the end of it when it breaks out, I was thinking of Phil Collins, so I was doing those sporadic fills, and then I got in. Because the feel of the song was da 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 right? Yeah. That's what I did the whole thing. And then when it got into the end, I went boom, 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 boom. And it got into that. Yeah. So it it is a it is a you know, where you creatively are inspired. The rest of the things were man, I I I it would be hard to say that's the first one that comes to mind, but there's so many more, you know. Thousands. Well, you came on my radar when uh, when the Trisha had um, the Everybody Knows record. Yeah. Shaka doom broom did the boom. Yeah. And that's a fill I use to this day. Shata that flam baba. Yeah. And it's and and then you are so recognizable on the radio, like all your little <laughs> the transitions. Da doom doom pss, yeah. cross stick. And I think it's because you have that musical mind of being a trained piano player and knowing what to stay out of the way. Yeah, and, musical. You know, have a musical mind, and that's probably more important than being a chopmeister. Like, you know? like the guy from Dream Theater, right? <laughs> well, he plays that music the way he sees. The way it's supposed to be played. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's well, you know, yeah. interestingly enough, because I had talked to him before mm -hmm. when my wrist was destroyed, mm -hmm. and I was put back together. It was like a Les Paul syndrome because the orthopedic that did it. On the ongoing, he said, if you ever do play again, I'm going, what? Yeah. Excuse me? He said, how are you going to hold your sticks? I said, overhand. Yeah. I would be. And so he, he put all this together that way. Because I have a, a rebuilt uh, scaphoid. You're, bi you're bionic. Yes, yeah. I am. <laughs> so, uh, but with that, you know, with that, <clears throat> there was some technical aspects that went away, unfortunately. But meat and potatoes. You will always have your feel. You always have your heart. You will always have your soul and your recognizable, you know, approach to things. Barry Beckett always just said, it's about a groove. Yeah, man. That's what I tell the kids. Can you choose the right thing to play quickly and do that for three and a half minutes and make it feel good, make the band smile, make the artist smile, make people dance? That's yeah. the goal. And and be able to, to honor the song. Honor the song. Just like you just said, when you got down... You simplicity went boom, kaku, boom, kaku. you know, you obviously, I, I know what you can do because we had talked about this before when all this was happening, everything I talked to Rich, I said, you know, I would love to get with you because he's such a technician that I would love to have innovations mm -hmm. on how I could enhance that. But I was trying to think what would I use it for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny for a case in point, you know, we were talking about songs with legacy that, let, you know, have, they're just good songs. Yeah. And one of the best ones out there that has tons of legacy is Don't Stop Believing by Journey, yeah. right? When a song is played right, right? When a song is played right, it just, my brother instilled in me, he's a, he's a piano player as well. Yeah. And he said, do not change up how these songs are played. I don't care how Neil Peart yeah. would play the fill from, you yeah. know, carry on my wayward son, play it like the way the guy play it, yeah. you know? I've, so in that song, with that being hammered in me over years and years and years playing with my brother, yeah. if I see somebody play Don't Stop Believing the Wrong Way, and it drives me 
bonkers. Well, it, was, it should. It, it was put together purposely. Oh it goes gosh. right with the guitar part. Oh, that. Ding, ga, do, ding, ding, boom. Is, is, ga, and it's played with the left hand lead, yeah. and he's playing everything with his. It's brilliant. Yeah. That guitar player is one of the greatest I've heard. Yeah. So Neil fun. Sean. So fun to have you here. Yeah, buddy. What, uh, how can people find you? EddieBears.com? Yeah. EddieBears.com. What's your Instagram? Is your discography on there? Good is your dis- is your recorded discography on there? <laughs> it is, and my movie credits. I, oh, and plus, so it, probably you can go to like allmusic.com. That's that's where my discography from my website links to. Okay, mm-hmm. perfect. That's smart. So that's that's like a hundred pages of stuff. <laughs> you know, there's uh, right now there's one thousand eighty something uh, <laughs> songs. Just, I mean, no, albums. Yeah, yeah. albums. <clears throat> yeah, albums. Oh my god. About a thousand eighty one. Which, ironically, we talk about diversity. Right now, just entered for 2019 was a record I did with Stevie Nicks. Mm-hmm. Really? You know? Nice. Yeah. yeah. What's what, what's one thing you would love to do that you never had the opportunity to do or play? Style of music or anything? Style? Yeah. Uh, boy, I would have to get with Rich <laughs> and learn it. <laughs> Well, you know, it's so funny. We, you know, we train our whole lives to, to, to be stylistically diverse and bend genres and, you know, people, uh, people that might not know anything about our history or schooling, they just go, oh yeah, he's that guy that just gets up there and bashes those Aldine songs out, you know, and oh that's, God, that's so fine. You there's know, so fine. much more to what that, you do. That's oh how they, God. that's how yeah. they see, uh, you know? the, see, I know. Yeah. Only from his beginnings, I know. Right. So, you know, when I, if anybody, uh, you know, tries to say, oh yeah, he just does that. Yeah. Then, yeah, you, know. you try it. Eddie's got my back, guys. Yeah. Back off, Eddie. Uh, Barry's I, I know what it's like to play that. I can't play like him. You know, well, either the that energy or one on one. Come on over here <laughs> to the studio here and sit down. Yeah, and what's, let, what's let him do? show you what he can do, and let's see if you can do that. Eleven years ago, when he and I became friends, we used to put a lot of videos up, and I did a lot of video work for him. Yeah. And some of the comments we would get be like, "Oh, anybody could do that." I'm like, "Oh yeah, well you, you try it. Well, you, you try suffered. cranking out a song in three and a half minutes and have them be happy with it and keep getting called back." Yeah, yeah. It's and play it well. But see, that's the dilemma I was mentioning about. These yeah. are the people who create the state of art in their mind, and they condescend to anything lesser. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Instead of somebody who has that gift, that why longevity is there is because you know what I am with this artist, and this is the songs he does, and I honor those songs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you know, the real, um, I think, the real skill in a live drummer is to go out there and say, I'm going to play Hicktown for the 10th thousandth time <laughs> like it's the first time. And that's, you do. that's really the discipline mm-hmm. that comes from d- exactly. that job. And then a session drummer, you're, you're almost like a jazz musician. You have to quickly improvise in the moment, come up with something that's perfect. You're improvising, right? You're, 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 oh. imp- you're, cre- you're improvising a part mm-hmm. and then being able to execute it quickly with a click track. Well, there's, there's more to that. And that is, you'll be given a basic format, mm-hmm. right? Through that process, they're going to go, oh, by the way, now we're not going to do that uh, instrumental now. Now we're going to go to here and this is going to be halved and this yeah. is going to be We're going to throw you a curve. And we're going to start editing this down there. How quick can you retain that? Yeah. And perform it. Yeah. yeah. The, your Hicktown, I was just thinking about that that story. Back in my cover band days, that was my Enter Sandman. So when we used to play Enter Sandman, and it was like my eyes would roll. I'm like, oh, gosh, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, but you have, I've, I've watched you. In, in the couple of shows that we saw you, uh, I believe it was in Charlotte, and there was a, a band opening up for you mm-hmm. that the drummer just was like, just phoning it in. You know, no energy. You could read his face. The whole band was kind of like that. Yeah. Wow. And, it, and it was like, wow, this is really not fun for me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then you guys come on. You guys bring the fire. Of course. You know? just, just, you, you're happy to be there. You know what you got, you know? and the But the guys who proceeded there, it's like, man. Yeah, oh, people are paying to be there. You know, yeah. it's like. It has tw- an effect on the audience. $20 an hour for oh. a babysitter and then $180 tickets and oh. then $20 beers and then parking. You better <laughs> step up to the plate, <laughs> right? Absolutely, yeah. But, um, but, you, but not everybody understands that. Yeah. You know? What a thrill. This is such a thrill. Oh, Thank you so too. much for being here, Eddie. Yeah, man. Oh, my God. Good to meet you, man. And we definitely have to go out and get that martini. Eddie and I, we like our martinis, man. Real oh, nice, Eddie. real cold. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Be sure to like, rate, share, and comment. And we'll see you next time. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, 
and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.